Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This week we begin a sermon series on prayer that we've entitled, Can You Hear Me Now? A reference to those old cell phone commercials. Do you remember those? I think it was Verizon that did them, the one where the guy is walking around in normal everyday places and then weirder and weirder places, always asking, can you hear me now, into a cell phone, trying to convince everyone that their company had the best connection. I wish they would come to my house and do that commercial because the answer would be no, I cannot hear you now. Now, I've been a pastor for 10 years. I'll be starting my 11th year in a week. And recently, I figured something out, and this is my confession as a pastor to you, the people of the church. The church stinks at teaching people how to pray. We're just really bad at it. In fact, most of the time, I think we take it for granted. We tell people to pray. We say it's important. We model it somewhat in worship on Sunday morning. But the way we act mostly says that we expect you to figure it all out on your own. Maybe if you're lucky, you get a quick Sunday school lesson about it. Maybe we talk about it in terms of theology, but we rarely teach people how to do it. Now, the thing about prayer is that I think most of us, it's probably like in the top 10 things people have said to me, I'm sure, probably like number two or three. People will say to me, I don't think I'm doing it right. And Lord help us if we are ever asked to pray out loud. Have you ever been in a group, uh, if you've ever been in Bible study with me, you've been in a group where I'll say, okay, somebody pray for us, and then I close my eyes and look at the ground while I wait for somebody to volunteer. And it sometimes takes a few minutes. Now, I'll confess to you that it's just as bad in a group of pastors. We all wait for somebody else to start doing it. Now, the thing is, I, you know, people say that, um, that public speaking is the number one fear, fear. I think that if you're in church, the number one fear is really praying out loud. People don't want to do it. They're scared of it for, for reasons that are real. So here's what we're going to do over the next few weeks. We're going to talk about prayer. We're going to talk about what it is and what it isn't. We're going to search scripture together and see how prayer is used by men and women within our ancestors in the faith. And we're going to practice praying together in different ways. As a basic format, we're borrowing a bit from a book um, called Help Thanks Wow by a Christian author named Anne Lamott. If you've um, never read any of her books, they're fantastic. And so in order to give us a way to break down this really big topic of prayer, we're borrowing her three main categories, help, thanks, and wow, and we've added two more that we think are important, sorry and yes. All is a way for us to help learn different ways to pray. They're kind of categories that will help set it up for us over the next few weeks. So today we're starting with help. Anne Lamont says this prayer comes when we hit the bottom. She writes this about it. This is where restoration can begin because when you're still trying to fix the unfixable, everything bad is engaged. The chatter of your mind, the tension of your physiology, all the trunks and wheel-ons you carry from the past, it's exhausting and crazy-making. Help. Help us walk through this. Help us come through. It is the first great prayer. Help as a category of prayer has a long history in scripture. In the Psalms, these kind of prayers are called laments. These are prayers where the writer calls out for God to save him from his enemies, to protect him, to restore him, to heal him. The psalm that John read for us just a few minutes ago is one such lament. Psalm 38 ends with these words, Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, do not be far from me. Make haste to help me, my Lord and my salvation. Now we can pray asking for help in all kinds of situations. When life feels like too much, when we feel like we're losing it, when our life is in transition and we need wisdom about what choice to make, when we are struggling with anger or hurt or grief or sadness or envy, when someone we love is dying or sick, when we ourselves are dying or sick, when we are in ruin, when we're at the end of our rope. Now, we can, of course, ask for help anytime, but most of us wait until we've exhausted our own resources before calling out to God. Our example in faith today comes from the second scripture passage that we just read, where Moses calls out to God for help. Now, let me give you a little bit of background. Let me situate us as to where we are so that you can understand the story a bit. 
Moses has already been called out by God as a leader, and God has already saved the Israelites from the Egyptians. They have gone through the Red Sea and have begun their journey through the desert to the Promised Land. And all of this time, God has been providing for them. He has kept them safe and has given them manna to eat each night. But the people are stubborn and the journey is hard. So here we are in Numbers. Now, the setting in the entire book of Numbers is a journey through the wilderness. In the wilderness is actually the Hebrew title for Numbers. So anytime you find yourself reading Numbers, you just think to yourself, journey. It's a journey through the wilderness of life. The wilderness kind of acts as a a main character through the book, and it's used by the author to present problems and possibilities for shaping the community's identity as the newly redeemed people of God. This period of wandering through the desert is necessary, and I think God kind of uses it as a buffer between liberation and landedness so that the people can be formed into this new identity that he's given them. They have to learn how to be the people of God, just as we have to learn how to be the people of God. And God knows that this is going to take a while, so they're in the wilderness for a long time. As you read through Numbers, you'll find out that this does not unfold easily for Israel or really in truth for God. It's a lot of work to form people into the people of God. The people have been taken out of Egypt, but it proves difficult to take Egypt out of the people. The familiar ordinariness, orderliness of slavery in Egypt seems at times preferable to them to the insecurities of life lived from one oasis to the next. I want you to think about the last time that you took a car trip with your family. Has anybody here done that a lot? Any car trippers? We've got like three people over here and no people over here raising their hand. Good morning. (laughs) We used to take a lot of car trips when I was in my family. Think about your last car trip. About how long into it does it take before the most annoying question in the world gets asked? Like five minutes, an hour? Five, five minutes, okay? We used to take a lot of car trips when I was little. My parents um, were... um, are originally from Arizona, but left at 19 when my dad joined the Navy. So they would take us on road trips to see family, and we would go, uh, we were mostly on the East Coast, so we'd go from the East Coast over to Arizona, and we would go, we moved from state to state a lot, and so we did a lot of driving to see friends and family. We drove a lot. Now, my mom was always really great about packing the car and keeping us busy. We sang and played games and ate snacks. My sister and I were just remembering that we used to, my mom used to buy us um, pineapple juice in those little metal cans. She she didn't know you could still find them, so I found one for her at the grocery store the other day. I learned the states and their capitals in the car because mom made it a game. We made up silly songs to entertain my younger siblings, one of which was about a Tyrannosaurus Rex because he loved dinosaurs. But there was also a lot of complaining. A lot of are we there yet, and she's touching my side of the car, and my Capri Sun is leaking. Do you remember the Capri Suns where you had to put the straw in, and if you didn't put it in just the right way, they leaked all over you? They're much better now than they used to be. There was a lot of grumbling. A lot of, I don't want that to drink, I want something else. And that's where we find the Israelites, is right in the middle of the part of the car trip where you start to get really annoyed and your dad says, I will turn this car around. Long enough into their journey that the grumbling has begun, the are we there yet have begun to take over, and they are complaining about everything they can find to complain about. Now, you'd think in the desert, their complaint would be that they were hungry and can't find food, but God has already provided food. He brings them manna from heaven every day for them to eat. So their complaint becomes that they miss the food they had in Egypt that was free. Did you notice that little bit in the scripture? It came to them at no cost, it said. They said that it was better than the manna from heaven that God provided for them every day, and they missed the taste of it. They're asking for meat. Now, the beginning of this chapter in number introduces us to a pattern that we'll see repeated through episodes. It begins with murmuring, followed by judgment, a cry of repentance, intercession, and deliverance. The people murmur, grumble, complain about something. The complaint gets louder. God hears the complaint. God gives them some kind of consequence for their grumbling. The people cry out to God through Moses to repent. Moses intercedes to God on their behalf, and they are delivered. And then the cycle begins all over again when they find out something other to complain about. 
So here, our grumbling episode is about the food, but it isn't the people who cry out for help, it's Moses, and his lament really has nothing to do with the actual food, but rather with the people that God has called him to lead. Moses' lament is about the heavy burden that God has placed upon him to lead these horrible people. The people have become so hard to lead, they're grumbling and complaining all the time, and Moses finds it hard to bear. He basically says to God, how could you do this to me? You made me do this, and it's too hard. I didn't give birth to them. I shouldn't have to take care of them. The people are too hard-headed. They won't do what I tell them to do. And you haven't provided me with the resources I needed to be able to take care of them. Basically, he says, if you're going to make me lead them, you've got to give me more to work with. So God's answer, right after the verses that we read, is to help provide people to share the burden. He calls people out from the midst of the community to begin to lead alongside Moses, and then he answers their prayer for meat by providing them with quail. Now, we could look at the people's cry for help for food, their struggle with not being content with that which God has provided, which is certainly something all of us struggle with, but I think there's something so real in Moses' lament that it caught my attention this week. I've been rereading a book this week I read a few years ago called The Water Will Hold You, A Skeptic Learns to Pray by a woman named Lindsay Crittenden. And in it, she tells her journey into the faith after the murder of her brother and during her mother's battle with cancer and her father's battle with Alzheimer's. And she says this about prayer. Prayer worked when I told the truth, not when I was trying to impress or be a good girl or a good Episcopalian or do things the right way. Prayer worked when I told the truth. She learned that prayer didn't depend on belief or posture, that it didn't demand one say the right words in just the right way. In fact, she said she learned that the words themselves mattered less than the actual saying of them. They provided a way in. They, to put it another way, Anne Lamont says this, most good, honest prayers remind me that I am not in charge. I think that's what Moses' prayer for help did. Sometimes we just need to say the lament aloud so that we can recognize what is going on, what we're feeling, and by acknowledging that to God, healing and help can come. If you'll remember about a week ago, my dad, uh, I guess almost two weeks ago now, my dad went back into the hospital uh, for an infection in his foot that has just been an ongoing cycle since like February. And... um, Q had been with us for, I guess, about a week week at that point. It was a Thursday morning. I woke up on Thursday morning, and I was in an absolutely miserable mood. Has anybody ever woken up and just had a miserable day, and you didn't know why you were upset? Any hands for that? We'll get a couple nods and grumblings, right? So all day, I mean, poor Dwight, bless him, I was just complaining all day about everything was wrong. We couldn't do this. I was exhausted. I had, wasn't getting enough work done, and, you know, the girls were out of control, and, you know, everything was horrible. And it took until about um, maybe 4 o'clock on Thursday afternoon when I finally realized that what was really upsetting me was that I hadn't been able to go to Pennsylvania to see my dad while he was in the hospital. Because every other time he'd gone into the hospital, I had been able to go up to sit with him. And as soon as I texted it to Dwight and said, this is really why I'm upset, I just figured it out, I immediately began to feel better. Now, that didn't mean I wasn't still upset, that I wasn't still tired, and that I wasn't still worrying about my dad, because all of those things were still true. But in releasing that to Dwight, and more importantly to God, it allowed me to be able to ask for the help that I needed. Now, friends, we only have to think about the events of this week to know that we are at a point in our world where we need to cry out for help. We are at the end of our rope. We now live in a world where someone, purely because of their hatred based on somebody else's skin color, walked into a sanctuary, a literal and spiritual place of healing, redemption, safety, and love, and gunned down nine people. We live in a place where a grandmother had to tell her granddaughter to play dead in order to protect her. We live in a world where racism, a sin that makes us uncomfortable to name, has made churches have to worry about the safety of themselves and their parishioners during worship and Bible study. We live in a world where bomb threats are made to churches, where a man is stabbed in the doorway of a church that had just spent time helping this man to a place of healing. We live in a world where fear and hatred and isms and schisms and suffering seem to have the last word. 
Now, the good news is that it doesn't have to. The Bible tells us in Psalms that our help, our salvation comes from the Lord. And that's the truth, but it's a hard truth because it never promises that the help is going to come easy or that it's going to come in a way that we want it to or a way that we like or the way that we want it to look. Now, the Israelites asked for help, right? And God's answer had them wandering through the desert, being formed into the people of God for 40 years. Help comes, but it requires work on our part. We have to cry out to God. If we don't want the hatred and fear we've seen take hold this week, if we don't want racism to divide our church again, if we don't want fear of the other or anger to have the last word, then we have to cry out. We have to pray with our words that God will change our hearts, that God will help us to forgive as the victim's families have, and that God will move in such a way that people will begin to change and to heal. But after we use our words, we have to be ready to pray also with our lives and with our actions, to stand in solidarity with our AME brethren, to work for unity in our churches and in the world. Because if I've learned nothing else in 10 years of ministry, I've learned this. Prayer isn't just about words. It's a way of life. Maybe this week your world has been rocked. Maybe you're feeling at the end of your rope. It could be because of the events of this week or because of your own personal life struggles. So we want to offer you a chance to cry out for help today a chance to name your need, whatever that need is, before God, and to collectively ask for God's help. So we're going to practice prayer this morning. This is what we're going to do. We're going to go into a time of silence. If you choose to, you may come up to the altar and either kneel or stand, whatever you feel comfortable with. If you choose to, you can stay in your pew and just make yourself comfortable where you are. If you choose to, you could just find a place in the center aisle to stand. However you want to pray, you are welcome to do so. We're going to go into a time of silence to pray, and then I'm going to lead us in a little bit um, with a little bit of words as we pray together. And then at the end, we will stand and pray our prayer with one voice that's in your bulletin and that will be on the screen when I tell Barry to put it up there. So I'm going to give you a minute to make yourself comfortable. If you'd like to come to the altar, you can. If you would like to stay in your seat, you can do that as well. Let's prepare our hearts as we go to God in prayer. God, in these moments, we remember that you are here, and that we are here, and that this is enough. God, in these moments, we lift up to you all of the things that we need help with. You are here, and we are here, and that is enough.
God, we lift before you all of those who mourn this day. And we especially remember those who lost their lives in Charleston this week. We remember the shooter, and as you have asked us to do, we pray for our enemies, for all of those for whom anger and hatred has taken such a root in their lives that actions like this seem to make sense, we pray. We lift before you Mother Emmanuel, Metropolitan UMC in DC, and the AME Church in DC who had the bomb threat this week. We lift up their leaders and their congregations and the ministries that they are doing. Remember, God, that you are here and we are here, and that is enough. We lift up all of those who are at the end of their rope, who don't know where to turn, or what to ask for. And we provide that we ask that you would provide them space and the words they need. We lift up all of those in our world, in our community, and in our church that do not yet know a healing and loving, grace-filled relationship with you. We pray that in these moments, you would help them to know that you are here and we are here, and that is enough for this moment. We come before you and we say simply, help. Help. And we pray together the words that you gave to Christ to share with us as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So I changed my mind about the prayer with one voice. What I'm going to ask you to do is to take it home with you. If you are somebody who struggles with words during a time of prayer, uh, these can be your words this week. They can be your way in. 
And we will, uh, we will just all pray them together during the week. Friends, we have heard the word of God read and proclaimed, so let us stand in response to that and sing together our hymn of sending. More love to thee, O Christ, number 453.